Thank you for joining us today. We are excited for this opportunity to share our story about Wall Lake's Early Childhood Center's journey from conception through design. Our presentation today will take you through four distinct parts. Think, dream, dare, and design, which started in 2019 and continues today with an opening for the 2022 school year. I am an architect and an accredited senior educational planner at TMP. My name is Nandita Mishra, and my past experience and passion in teaching and learning transcends into design, designing inspirational, immersive educational facilities that empower both the next generation of learners and educators. Yeah, thank you, Nandita. And I'm Kathy Kohansky. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Learning Services here in Wald Lake Consolidated Schools. And Nandita and I have been partnering for the last several years on this project. Uh, I come to this job with 27 years of experience in education, both as a teacher and as an early literacy expert. I was a building administrator for about 10 years and then most recently joining the Wald Lake team just a few years ago. So this project has not just been our work, but it's really been our passion. And that we hope our presentation today will allow you to learn about early childhood development and the positive effects of creating environments that support the Absolutely. whole child. We, under, we want you to understand the importance of a strong curricular vision and that the impact that can have on effective pedagogy and future trends discuss how to get buy-in <clears throat> for your vision from key internal and external stakeholders, identify how those curricular goals are used to refine and perfect the design of the built environment, and then how to maintain your vision mm -hmm. through budgetary constraints in the implementation process. So really, uh, we wanted this facility to sit within three main concepts. One is the mission of the district the instructional philosophy around it, uh, and how does this facility, the environment itself, the building itself, fit within our physical district? So back in 2018, our district did identify an opportunity for a bond, and we had broad stakeholder and, uh, and um, educational visioning sessions. These helped identify the need for an early childhood center to complement our K-12 existing programs. And this new Early Childhood Center we know would be an inclusive space and a program that highlights teacher collaboration and really focusing on student interaction. So we were fortunate enough in 2019 mm -hmm. that we realized one of the largest bonds in state history with overwhelming community support. I think we had over 70% mm -hmm. community support for this bond and we prioritized this new Early Childhood Center. Kathy, if mm -hmm. I may just interject, mm -hmm. you know, the visioning sessions that we held where um, community-based sessions and you know we reached out to a broad sector of people within the entire district in fact there were attendees from neighboring school districts to mm -hmm. see what this conversation was all about so mm -hmm. it was quite interesting yes yeah so broad stakeholder participation really uh, robust participation led to this conception so it's yes. so exciting so the new Early Childhood <coughs> Center lives within our mission. And that mission is to create caring and responsible citizens. The conception of our new Early Childhood Center was just as you described, Nandita, mm -hmm. that partnership between parents and our school community, but really focusing on the research on how the early childhood experiences will set students up for future success. So as you can see on the next slide here, we're a very large district within our county. We have many buildings, many programs that we support, um, and quite a large footprint. But our goal in seeking that bond was so that we could create a continuum of services for our families, preparing our preschool students to be successful academically, socially, emotionally, and behaviorally, and really setting them up for success, not only just in a full day of kindergarten, mm -hmm. but throughout, throughout their, their K-12 experience with us. And our other goal was that this early childhood center would really stand out 
as um, a, a center which focuses on the whole child with comprehensive systems of support as well as family partnerships. So those were priorities for us. So in talking about how the district uh, is, is laid out and how this new early childhood center sort of situates itself within that, um, we know we wanted to provide necessary access for our current families, but then also we wanted to attract and retain new families to our district in our bordering communities. So as you can see where the new early childhood center is at the bottom of the map there, it's really located uh, in the heart of nature, but it's very close to a frequently traveled highway system where our families commute to and from work. But in order to develop that broad approach and make sure that we're servicing all of our families, we kept the existing preschool opportunity at Twin Sun, and we developed an early childhood addition to Dublin Elementary, which will mirror all of these, uh, all of the programs that we will offer at the new early childhood center, so that we could capture students from all corners of the district mm -hmm. while maintaining equity in our programs. So we also know that as our family needs may shift in the future, we can be flexible and responsive to providing that comprehensive program, no matter where our families mm -hmm. are coming from in the district. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. Mm -hmm. um, so now I would like us all to take a minute, pause, take a deep breath, close your eyes and visualize, just visualize for a second, your earliest memories and experiences from childhood. Think about the sounds, think about the smells and experiences. So, I'm sure we have all thought of something, right, mm -hmm. Kathy? Mm -hmm. But not sure, before, before we dwell into that piece, I just want, you, want to bring out, not sure if you have read this interesting book that Kathy shared mm -hmm. with me recently, The Power of Moments which talks about certain experiences having a lasting impact on our lives. It could be a teacher spotting a talent you did not know you had, or a chance encounter with a stranger that becomes your partner for life. Mm -hmm. And we also see this consistent with Disneyland, you know, the experiences they create Absolutely. and, um, you know, lasting mem mm -hmm. memories that mm -hmm. that equates to. So I'm gonna come back to the main question, how do we create these memories and why were those childhood memories mm -hmm. still entrenched in your brain? Absolutely. You know, Wh what made that happen? Because we don't remember everything, we only remember a few things. Mm -hmm. What created that and what memories do we want to create in these learning environments that create these holistic experiences for our children? Yes. So a large body of research today emphasizes this importance that we just talked about, about these holistic experiences in early childhood education, mainly to instill deep learning mm -hmm. so we create lifelong learners. Also, if you understand what neuroscience has uncovered, all this will seem so obvious. Mm -hmm. Did you know that there are about 2,000 days from a time a child is born to when they start kindergarten. And in that time, a child's brain grows about 95%, which to me is mind boggling. Remarkable. But this alone epitomizes the importance of this conversation. I won't dwell any deeper into this, but let's pause for a minute and take a look at this two minute video, which really will help hit this thing home for us. Mm -hmm. A child's experiences during the earliest years of life have a lasting impact on the architecture of the developing brain. Genes provide the basic blueprint, but experiences shape the process that determines whether a child's brain will provide a strong or weak foundation for all future learning, behavior, and health. During this important period of brain development, billions of brain cells called neurons send electrical signals to communicate with each other. These connections form circuits that become the basic foundation of brain architecture. Circuits and connections proliferate at a rapid pace and are reinforced through repeated use. 
Our experiences and environment dictate which circuits and connections get more use. Connections that are used more grow stronger and more permanent. Meanwhile, connections that are used less fade away through a normal process called pruning. Well-used circuits create lightning-fast pathways for neural signals to travel across regions of the brain. Simple circuits form first, providing a foundation for more complex circuits to build on later. Through this process, neurons form strong circuits and connections for emotions, motor skills, behavioral control, logic, language, and memory during the early critical period of development. With repeated use, these circuits become more efficient and connect to other areas of the brain more rapidly. While they originate in specific areas of the brain, the circuits are interconnected. You can't have one type of skill without the others to support it. Like building a house, everything is connected, and what comes first forms a foundation for all that comes later. So, how are we creating these holistic experiences to support the whole child? At Wall Lake, our dream for this new early childhood center was to create these memorable experiences. To create these experiences, we decided to dive deep in strategizing how academics, reading, writing, social emotional learning, play, nature, behavioral, self-regulation and inclusion could contribute to this holistic experience. We look to create and support the whole child. So we leaned upon research, and I know we have been talking about research, but we really dove deep into research to understand how the physical environment and nature and play truly support the whole child. Yes. And the more we dove into research, right, Kathy, mm -hmm. the more we found that this conversation had started centuries ago. Frederick Forbell, Horace Mann from the 1700s, mm -hmm. Maria Montessori, John Dewey from the 1900s, mm -hmm. to Jerome Brunner and Jean Piaget from the 20th century have all emphasized the importance of learning by doing and discovery and interactive yeah. and engaging opportunities for students. All these pioneers had the same vision on how children learn. Mm -hmm. We know now that every experience and interaction that a child has, has an impact on their development in early childhood. And advancements in modern technology and current day research in, you know, mm -hmm. not only neuroscience, but mm -hmm. even child psychology is proving these theories to be true every day. And that the greater the connection between the experiences and the environment, the better we address the child holistically. Yeah, absolutely, Nandita. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the current research that support exactly what these pioneers have known for, for many centuries. Um, we know that, that we're aware that there is, has been a pretty large gap between what we know about children's learning and development, but what we're actually using and what we're actually doing with our physical spaces. So um, just going back to some of this research that you've, that you've started to talk about, uh, we know that in our first five years of development, we're tremendously affected by those experiences. And oftentimes those experiences will override anything genetic. Mm -hmm. We know genetics are important, mm -hmm. right? But at least according to the latest research and our latest thinking, we know experiences are critical during these first five years um, in, in developing things like language and reasoning and empathy. And that's really um, where our learning should focus mm -hmm. in, these, in these places. And what we've learned from neuroscience, just, just like you talked about, uh, those experiences and those connections that we make for children, are, are just critical in the first five years. We also know that we want to reduce stress for children, and I don't just mean everyday kinds of mm -hmm. stress, but I'm talking about serious stresses in children's lives, things like addiction and poverty and starvation, abuse and crises that children um, manage in their, in their young lives. The more we're able to mitigate and reduce that, the greater it will be for our overall well-being, not just of students, mm -hmm. but we know that that contributes to lifelong health. Absolutely 
Absolutely. So we're really looking at uh, this research through how do we not only create those experiences and those connections, but foster the well-being of the whole child so that they can grow up to be healthy adults. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we do know that, and, and you touched a little bit on, on talking about the research of the interaction with nature as another, mm -hmm. um, as another teacher, so to speak, in the environment, but we know how important play is. And um, just as Mr. Rogers, uh, our, our good old friend on television and, and our expert really in child development, he really talks about that play is the work of children. We want children to play. When we see mud puddles as adults, we avoid them. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> children get drawn to them, sort of magnetized, and, and they want to jump and splash. And I think we can all relate to that and thinking back to those discoveries when we were young children. Um, it's important to understand that children have a natural instinct to play. They want to explore and discover and use their senses and their motor skills. All of this contributes to that cognitive development we, we heard about in that video. And we also know that play develops some other really critical pieces like social skills, creativity, communication, critical thinking, collaboration those great 21st century skills mm -hmm. that we've been hearing about in research for the last decade or so. And we know that the National Association for Education of Young Children have identified really some ingredients for successful learning. Learning occurs best when children are mentally active, engaged, socially interactive, and able to build meaningful connections in their lives and it's oh. just like what you've been been talking about <laughs> yeah so how do we do this in the early childhood mm -hmm. center right kathy yeah. so as as we continue to conceptualize and talk about this we said okay here is an opportunity to really build our new early childhood center you know use play in nature as a foundational element right absolutely and build on it so how do we create these experiences so we started looking at creating these connections of the indoor physical environment mm -hmm. and working with the outdoor physical environment as an extension of the indoor space. Mm -hmm. Creating sensory learning opportunities, you know, looking at uh, gross motor areas, not mm -hmm. just on the outside with the playground sp spaces that mm -hmm. we are all familiar with, mm -hmm. but also looking at how we can supplement these indoors for right. kids. We also, we also looked at the outdoor spaces very intentionally in creating specific experiences where a child can observe and assort and you know we know kids like to play in dirt i know my yeah. boys did mm -hmm. uh, when they were growing yeah, up my kids and, too. Mm -hmm. and you know that's as you said their natural tendency to do why not build it why fight right. it build it into the design encourage it, encourage mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. you know bring in textures let them sense and feel what the different textures are around them absolutely that 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 connection between the indoor and outdoor is just such a key as we we're, we're thinking about, about how to create these spaces and, and grow these children. Um, I had spoken before about social emotional well-being and um, one of the things we know is that self-awareness, self-management, sort of where you manage your behaviors, mm -hmm. your awareness of others, of your relationship skills, being able to make decisions responsibly, all of those things are, are um, part of social emotional well-being. And so the, the connections between outdoors and indoors, the opportunities for play and interaction really build uh, at the heart what we want for social emotional well-being for our, our children. And again, just talking back about the research, we know that that strong social emotional foundation that we lay in early childhood for our children will impact children later in positive attitudes, positive behaviors, their academic performance, mm -hmm. their career path they might choose. Absolutely. And as we had mentioned, those those adult health outcomes. We want mm -hmm. to grow healthy adults. Mm -hmm. And really it starts with these basic foundations. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So again, coming back to the physical environment, what do we intentionally do? So at, the, more, the more we talked and the more we researched, creating these reading nooks mm -hmm. you know in within within the interior space 
to help address the child's anxiety. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes kids don't want to be part of a larger group and they mm -hmm. want to separate out and get into an area of recluse where they yeah. can self-regulate self -regulate mm -hmm. and um, quieten down. You know, using the right type of colors and textures. You know, are we, mm -hmm. are we trying to get a kid really energized or are we trying to keep them calm? You know, all mm -hmm. of that was really mm -hmm. discussed at extent to really make those decisions on what kind of a color palette we wanted to use within the facility. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we also looked strategically at acoustics. Mm -hmm. You know, when a child can't hear the teacher communicate, mm -hmm. they, we found, research mm -hmm. found that they tend they to kind of disengage, disengage or mm -hmm. lash out mm -hmm. because they are frustrated. They can't sure. get what the teacher is trying to communicate. So acoustics was very important, yes. not just in, as architects, we talk about that in large group areas, mm -hmm. but really looking at every learning nook and cranny of the building yeah. to yeah. address the piece of acoustics. Yes. We looked at creating sensory walls. We made mm -hmm. sure the scale of the building fit the size of the kids, you know, the, the mm -hmm. children ages three to five in this new early childhood center were our key um, mm -hmm. users and mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure the building supported them. Absolutely. Um, we're going to talk about the link to academics. So we've talked all about this play and our social interactions, and but what about the academics? We mm -hmm. don't want to disregard that. But really what research has shown us and the research that not only early literacy experts and early childhood experts have been doing around the country, but in, in Michigan where we are, um, really has focused on being intentional about teaching academics through things like dramatic play, read alouds, interactive vocabulary and phonological awareness type play activities, there may be brief instruction in things like letter names or counting sounds, forms, conversations, abundant reading materials and collaborations with our families so that we can promote that literacy and academic development. So all of these things that we've been talking about, the research with the connections and the play and the social interactions and, and, the, and the, the types of textures and, and, and sensory areas that we're using all contribute so when children feel that comfort and that engagement they're more likely to participate in the academic learning too so we build that in to the physical environment which i know you're going to talk about yep absolutely so just creating a variety of spaces to support <laughs> these variety of activities kathy just described you know she talked about dramatic play you know why should you know when we talk about dramatic play in elementary schools you know mm -hmm. it really resides mainly in their multi-purpose rooms, you know, where you have mm -hmm. a stage and it's designed with a curtain mm -hmm. and so on. Why should it be in just one spot? Why cannot it be spread out throughout the facility? Mm -hmm. So really designing these type of spaces intentionally to support these different type of activities was really thought through in every aspect of the physical environment. Mm -hmm. We also looked at furnishings so create flexible yeah. opportunities for not just the learners in the space, mm -hmm. but also the educators so they could change the pedagogy in the type of delivery they needed to make within right. the space. Right. Um, we also, um, you know, looked real deep into daylighting. Yeah. You know, I know daylighting may not directly connect to mm -hmm. the reading and writing mm -hmm. and the academic aspect, but mm -hmm. it does mm -hmm. indirectly connect to it because mm -hmm. when you have the right type of lighting and the right renditions in the space, it makes for a more engaging environment Absolutely. for kids to want to do some of these activities in the space. Absolutely, it's just so much more conducive to learning and learning for all learners. So I want to transition and talk just a little bit about more of our thinking about this space and that involves inclusion. And so inclusion really means literally teaching all children together mm -hmm. regardless of their ability level and inclusive programs really celebrate children's similarities as well as their different abilities and cultures. 
and in an inclusive classroom, children with special needs mm -hmm. can also take part in general education curriculum based on their age and their grade. Um, you know, one really interesting analogy when it comes to thinking about inclusion is, is let's say that you and I have very specialized mm -hmm. diets and we're going to a dinner and um, the person hosting the dinner says, oh, well, Nandita, Kathy, I've made special plates for you and your special plates have the special foods that you can eat um, versus a host at a party who may say, you know what, I have a buffet and on this buffet are all options so that Nandita, I know you have some allergies, but I guarantee that on this buffet you'll find what you need and Kathy will find what she needs. So it's really that analogy of thinking in terms of providing options and opportunities for all learners, regardless mm -hmm. of their ability inside these programs. So things like blended classrooms, I know we, we, we're gonna talk about how the physical space is laid out to promote that. But really, inclusion is another one of those key components of this early childhood center that, that we wanted to highlight and share. Absolutely. And to do that, what we did was we intentionally designed the classrooms in a way that um, they, all students in every classroom had access to similar opportunities. Mm -hmm. We do, in this new early childhood center, have special education, early childhood programs that mm -hmm. will be housed and, you know, should they be streamlined within the main activity area? Should they be uh, separated depending on ability? So everything is inclusive. Mm -hmm. Everything, every child mm -hmm. in these um, spaces will have access to all the same opportunities. Mm -hmm. We did also look at blended classroom opportunities where, yes. as we talked about, you know, not every child can be streamlined. Mm -hmm. However, there are based on abilities, kids that can be rolled into the general population. Absolutely. And d designing the spaces, making sure there is enough square footage to mm -hmm. accommodate the needs of all the students, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A child in a wheelchair per square foot need is a little different than more of an able-bodied child. So when you're looking at the size of the classrooms, design the classrooms in such a way that you are addressing right. all the needs within the space. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. So, so we're gonna talk a little <laughs> bit, I know, about um, our next uh, piece, and so that is the DARE. So, so we've been thinking about all of this research and how this all comes together. Now, how do you actually put this plan in motion? Well, <laughs> Nandita and I, we're a little bit like uh, Laverne and Shirley. We're laughing a little bit about this, but really, um, we both had this dream, so how do we make this dream come true? Well, it really took a lot of collaboration and partnership on our part, which we've loved working together and being partners these last several years, but we know it's a long process, right? I mean, uh, we had to work through roadblocks and solutions, and, and I had to work with staff and the superintendent. We had to work with committees. We know that addressing things like pedagogical change and, and new ideas about early childhood education can sometimes be met mm -hmm. with with questions and resistance. But really, um, I, I really just, I've, I've loved how we've challenged each mm -hmm. other throughout this oh, process too. <laughs> yes. Do you want to talk a little bit about that um, too? Yes, so, so when we first started this conversation, our goal was how do we, how do we work through these solutions, right? How, mm -hmm. do, we, how do we get all the teachers who are going to be teaching in this facility on board mm -hmm. with our thought process. So what we did was, or I should say, uh, <laughs> we did collaboratively yeah. was ask very difficult questions yeah. of everyone. We asked, we asked them first the why behind why they do what they do mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Yeah. Then we asked them the how, you know, mm -hmm. how do you implement the why of what you do? Mm -hmm. And we got different answers depending yeah. on who we talked to. Right. So of course, as we went through this process, we came up with some solutions. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you share these solutions? Right? Mm -hmm. Teachers are not necessarily architects; they are not necessarily designers. Mm -hmm. So we used virtual reality mm -hmm. to help get them engaged with their learning yeah. environment. Yeah. You know, um, used use the Oculus and use the Google 
uh, VR yeah, the goggles, VR goggles and uh, mm -hmm. so on to help them feel like they are part of their space. They could move around their space and see, mm -hmm. you know, literally experience this feel space, what, it's, like. uh, what mm -hmm. it's going to be like, and then start thinking outside the box. Yes. And that really helped getting them aligned Absolutely. Uh, it's, it was all baby steps. <laughs> yes, it was. And, you know, and just a lot of the research I know that we talked about, yes. we talked about with them too, because that research really helps push that mindset shift, right. that changing your way of thinking. One of the things that we were, we were really conscious about is we didn't just want to, you know, create, I know we're going to talk about mindset in a little bit, but how do you shift that old way of thinking to that new yeah, way of thinking. Right. Um, how do you change your behavior? We know we had um, budget and schedule constraints, oh. things that we envisioned that we wanted to see, right. but maybe we had to scale back. Um, but really challenging that status quo was, um, was really what we've spent a lot of time focusing on with our committee work this last couple of years. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the important part was to help understand, help everybody understand why this was even in the conversation, mm -hmm. right? And research really, just leaning on research to help people understand really mm -hmm. helped. The roadblocks were big and small. They came mm -hmm. in every sizes at various steps throughout the process. And believe it or not, we still have roadblocks. <laughs> 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 you know, we are under construction right now, mm -hmm. but the roadblocks by no means have uh, right. been erased. Right. Um, one important piece I do want to mention is that we made sure right from day one, as we envisioned, Kathy and um, myself, we envisioned what this facility could be, we made sure our construction managers were on board. Right. We made sure all different entities who were the main um, decision makers in the process, right. were on board with the direction we were headed. So of course, we had budgetary issues. You know, the project mm -hmm. were conceptualized in 2018. We are now in 2021, mm -hmm. getting close to fingers crossed post COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, however, mm -hmm. you know, we know how the market is today. You right. know, what, what the cost per square footage of construction is, it's significantly it's different than where we started <laughs> to where we are. Mm -hmm. So we have had to adjust things. But having your construction people on the same page yeah. as where we were really helped in, um, making those decisions on mm -hmm. where we could channel the budget cuts mm -hmm. to not impact the learning spaces right. that are going to impact the children on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, and that's that huge mindset shift. So when we talk about mindset, for those of you that, that maybe are familiar with the book Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck, if you're not familiar with it, I would encourage you to take a, a look at that book because it really isn't just for educators, it's for all adults. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is uh, challenging a growth mindset over a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. And so it's so important when you bring all stakeholders together, even like our construction managers, as, as you talked about, um, in understanding that vision um, and, and that growth, we wanted to grow out of that mindset of what preschool looked like 30 years ago mm -hmm. to what preschool should look like tomorrow. Um, and, and how do we envision that new approach to early childhood so we're not just repeating what we've done. We don't just create four walls, mm -hmm. you know, we don't just put up a door right. or put in a window. Those things all matter and so having everybody on board and shifting that mindset is, is so important. So we relied on the research, we relied on a lot of a collaboration, lots of meeting, lots of discussion, envisioning, and all of that helping to, to bring people on board. and. Um, so really with that goal of, of all, all stakeholders, so we talked about the group that I know I've worked with quite a bit, we've worked mm -hmm. together with them, and that is our professional development group. So how do we grow into this new facility? How do we, you know, you mentioned the, the, the VR, the virtual reality, you know, letting teachers kind of 
um, experience those spaces, um, bringing in early literacy expertise, an elementary principal, our special education staff, our teaching staff, all of these stakeholders have been part of this buy-in mm -hmm. to shifting to that futuristic way of thinking mm -hmm. and that, and that um, future vision for an early childhood center. So it's been positive, it's been a wonderful experience, and I know our, our staff is very excited about the next steps. Yes, and unfortunately the next steps are still the budget. The budget. And schedule. And the schedule. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going to come back and just uh, touch on the budget piece again. I already talked about bringing construction managers and mm -hmm. consultants and so on on board and them understanding really <laughs> what the vision is. So everybody could get creative. You know, once they understood it, they could mm -hmm. get creative. How do we and where do we? value engineer, which is not a good word in architecture. <laughs> uh, um, you know, how do we value engineer this project to make sure it aligns with the budgets available? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of it, that is our reality. Sure. There are X number of dollars it's available. That's the main driver. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. the main driver. So, so everybody who was involved in the project came to the conversation with real creative ideas mm -hmm. on how to address you know, these value engineering items. I'll just give you some very simplistic examples. Some were a little bit more complex for this, um, mm -hmm. you know, um, 60 minute presentation that we have here. But, um, you know, just finishes, for example. Mm -hmm. We simplified the finishes and right. went to simplistic solutions that were still robust mm -hmm. and provided longevity from an mm -hmm. operational standpoint for the district, but were still aesthetically aligned with where our vision was for the entire childhood center. Right. So at every step, we made sure every VE item that we were going to go through, whatever cuts we were gonna make within the facility to bring it aligned with the budget, how did that equate? It was almost an equation we worked with. Yeah. How does that equate to the overall education of the holistic mm -hmm. learning experiences that we are trying to create for the children? Right. Absolutely. Well, and with that challenging of the status quo, it's that dare to change. We know there are roadblocks right. there, but nothing says that you cannot change. And um, we don't know until we try. And, and through this process really has allowed us to realize our vision without compromising what we know to be our true goal with this early mm -hmm. childhood facility. So that's been the very exciting part, which leads us into, I think you're gonna talk yeah. about design next. Yes, so. and I'm gonna share with you some images um, and renderings of the facility. But before I go in there, I do want to, you know, I just recently came across this statistic and I wanted to share this with you before I go it's down. It's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. You know, so to understand the importance of school planning, you know, as an educational planner, this was really close to my heart. It is first important to understand that the built environment has a profound impact on the physical, cognitive, and social development of mm -hmm. children. And when I mean children, all age groups, yeah. not just early childhood. Right. So here is a statistic that I want to share with you. U.S. alone, uh, in our U.S. school buildings, we house about one-fifth of our population. Mm -hmm. One-fifth of 20% of 330 million people that spend most of their day teaching and learning mm -hmm. and growing in school facilities is a mind-boggling statistic. That's crazy. That is, that is huge, mm -hmm. which makes our job so critical mm -hmm. as we design and conceptualize educational facilities. Absolutely, a profound impact. Yes, like a profound, said, profound impact, yes. So I'm gonna share with you, um, you know, just the basic concept, we have talked about it through this presentation. The whole center was designed around the foundational elements of nature and play. That mm -hmm. was our concept for this mm -hmm. facility. And really the goal to just synthesize some of the things we talked about was to support sensory, social, emotional, deep, mm -hmm. hands-on learning opportunities for all students. Yes. And of course, inclusion and mm -hmm. empathy mm -hmm. were all integrated into the mix of this conversation. Mm -hmm. So I, this, this facility 
you know, we were trying to connect all the dots. So mm -hmm. as we started looking at this facility, how do you connect all these dots? Right. And that's kind of what you see in this graphic. We talked about we talked about curriculum. We talked a little bit about pedagogy. Mm -hmm. You know, should the teachers be teaching the same way they taught 30 years ago? Mm -hmm. And how is that teaching going to be different, mm -hmm. like moving forward? Right. What should the space be? You know, what should we be supporting for the educator? It was a pretty in-depth conversation. And then let's not forget the big impact of technology today. Mm -hmm. How does technology interface in this physical environment with the early learners. Okay. It's very different if you're talking about high schoolers right. versus three-year-olds and five-year-olds. Mm -hmm. So really looking at all these different bullet points, we started to conceptualize mm -hmm. this facility. We started a conceptualization with looking at a master plan. Mm -hmm. Our first goal was whatever the facility ends up looking like, what are the things that we are trying to address? So we started to look at the site. The overall site in which this building was going to sit on included an area of wetlands. Mm -hmm. There was, it's a contoured site with the whole forest mm -hmm. on the south end of the building. Mm -hmm. The north end has access to the main Road, the main road. Mm -hmm. the main road. So we started looking at the whole site holistically and came up with a master plan of how we were going to organize this building on the site to capture access to some of these engaging educational opportunities that the site mm -hmm. was lending us mm -hmm. towards. Yeah, you want to capitalize on what's there. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So here is a site plan that just gives you a little glimpse into um, kind of the footprint of what the site looked like. Mm -hmm. You see the wetlands are located on the west end of the building. The 13 mile road is really the main street that provides access to this site. And the way this building is angled is kind of on a diagonal axis that as people um, drive into the site, they have a clear visual on the entrance or mm -hmm. the main entry into the facility. The playground, as you can see, is almost cradled between the two classroom wings, which also provides like a safety and security component for the kids right. because Absolutely. they are separated from the main drives mm -hmm. um, that kind of encompass the front of the building. So coming back to the concept of nature and play, the biophilic mm -hmm. design approach was really connecting back to these wonderful elements the site mm -hmm. extended to us. You know, we, we, we took inspiration from the wetlands and we mm -hmm. actually researched the wetlands to yeah. figure out what the different layers of the wetlands mm -hmm. are. And we found the meadows are part of that equation. Mm -hmm. So the way the whole building was structured was you enter the building into the meadows mm -hmm. and then you kind of transition either to the forest or to the wetlands. And those mm -hmm. are our two classroom wings. Mm -hmm. Both of those kind of cradle the playground area like I shared mm -hmm. um, in the previous slide. And then some of the common activities are nestled between these two classroom wings. Yes. So talking a little bit more <laughs> about the outdoor space, um, you know, a distinctive playground that is nestled between the classroom wings was really intentionally designed mm -hmm. and in fact we are still going through detailed conversations yes. about it in determining all the different components that are going to be implemented and not only the component implementation but the colors and the finishes, finishes. <laughs> of the outdoor play equipment which yes. you can think even down to that level of detail when yes. it comes to connecting the outdoor play with the outdoor space and the whole feel of the facility and its surrounding and its surrounding environment. Absolutely. So. Thank you for yeah. bringing that up, Kathy. Yeah. We even looked at details of materiality mm -hmm. of the little walking trails that we created around the playground, mm -hmm. a little run where kids can run with their tricycles around that area. Mm -hmm. Every classroom actually within this facility will ha have access to a green belt, mm -hmm. which over time will be developed into 
um, you know, an extension of the indoor classroom space. And we have mm -hmm. been talking in detail about how teachers have an opportunity now just to collaborate on the inside, but also on the, the outside, outside uh, mm -hmm. with the green space mm -hmm. opportunities. Mm -hmm. Obviously, all playground areas are going to be fenced in because um, licensing requirements sure. in Michigan really have some criteria that we have to build into uh, the design. But we also have walking trails that mm -hmm. will bring kids to the wetland should a teacher decide mm -hmm. to take a field trip. I know. Or, or designing the, uh, the bound and the slides into the contours of the facility, of the land. Uh, of the land. Mm -hmm. So really um, looking at the outdoor space as an extension of the teaching and learning environments was um, important. Absolutely. So as you can see, we kind of started with the big picture and mm -hmm. now I'm going to pull you back um, into the main building plan. So this building is about 38,500 square feet in size, mm -hmm. which is a pretty generous yeah. size building. Uh, it will house uh, dedicated 16 classroom spaces, uh, which does not include two activity zones. Mm -hmm. These activity zones were intentionally designed as indoor uh, activity areas, mm -hmm. especially when weather and elements, um, you know, kind of keep the kids from going outside mm -hmm. to play, which is very critical, <laughs> as we said, you know, right. that is what kids do, that, that is the way they learn. We wanted to make sure they had similar opportunities on the interior right. of the building. Right. So every classroom not only opens into a green belt that is around each of the um, wing, classroom wing, but also an activity zone that every classroom opens into. There are operable walls that will completely open the face of the classroom mm -hmm. into the activity zone, making the classroom and the activity zone one holistic mm -hmm. entity should the teachers decide yeah. to use it. Yeah. And I know Kathy has been working with the teachers diligently in changing Absolutely. mindsets, right? That's the mindset <laughs> shift about by my room will open up into, into extended learning spaces and <laughs> extended opportunities for collaboration. Yes, yes, they will. And so that was that was that was a lot of work that we've been talking about and doing and you know and and we're we're getting excited about living into that space whereas before it was it was a big mindset yes. shift and it was a big change so it was a lot of talking about how can we how can we use that and and capitalize on that extension of the classroom. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to these 16 dedicated classrooms that will also house um, the um, special education programs. We have a dedicated sensory room. Mm -hmm. We have a physical therapy and speech therapy areas. We have a dedicated gross motor space, which will be a shared space, a mm -hmm. kitchen um, area where you know, kids who will be graduating from the preschool program going into kindergarten will have mm -hmm. an opportunity to kind of go and get lunch like the big yeah. kids do. Yeah. Stand in line, get to the survey. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we really, uh, really thought about uh, a multitude of um, elements as we looked at the whole yeah. building. So let's, let's just touch on the activity zone a little bit. So, this, so in addition to the green space that we mm -hmm. talked about that directly connects outside each classroom space, every classroom also connects to an indoor activity zone. Uh, each activity zone kind of um, is connected to about eight classrooms. We talked about 16 mm -hmm. classrooms total, so each classroom wing has eight classrooms. This activity zone um, truly is an extension of the classroom. It's learning beyond the classroom walls and will be designed with a lot of flexibility mm -hmm. uh, built into the space to create this inclusive uh, environment. As we go through the activity zone, I want to touch on some very specific feature elements that we have intentionally designed, starting with a child-sized door that connects back to the sensory lobby, which I will talk about in a minute. But this child-sized door really creates this sense of place for the children. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it becomes their little playhouse, mm -hmm. for lack of better terms. Uh, it's their building, it's their space. 
Uh, this activity zone uh, will also have standard size doors, of course, uh, next to the child size mm -hmm. doors for the adults and the teachers and the parents to walk through. And all signage will be intentionally designed to, again, emulate either the forest animals or the wetland animals, yes. depending on the wing you are associated with. The student entrance or the sensory lobby is very intentionally um, designed and you know, and I'm drawing for some personal experiences. My younger son just absolutely was a leg hugger. And I call him a leg hugger because mm -hmm. I could never drop him anywhere without him screaming his head off. Mm -hmm. um, not to say the learning environments he was getting dropped off were bad. They were actually mm -hmm. quite good. However, they were environments that were not intentionally designed for young children. Right. So the goal here was, you know, when parents are coming to drop off their kids, which they are going to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are activities for them. You have these rotating panels that you see in the background of the image in front of you, which will be designed with graphics. And the graphics are still in development. Of course, you don't see much on this screen. But these graphics will build on the uh, elements of nature from the wetlands and the forest. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, there will be writable surfaces for the kids, an area for the kid to uh, sit and wait if needed, you know, just, mm -hmm. just intentionally designed lobby right. space to help relieve the anxiety the children may feel mm -hmm. in this uh, new facility. Yes. So as we walk into the activity zone, I want to point on some very specific intentional elements that were designed into the space, starting with the pond. The pond is really the wet area in the space which will have a sink and will help support art and STEM related mm -hmm. activities uh, within this facility. The sensory park, which is an area with sensory elements and tables where kids could be working on projects mm -hmm. and fine motor development. Right. A campfire area which will be an area with mats on the floor for playing and reading mm -hmm. and, and, and small group engagement and activities. Mm -hmm. The clearing and the meadows, which will be a mostly open area with some soft climbing objects for play and gross motor development and the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. And the rabbit hole is kind of are going to be a really special space because it has multiple functions associated with it. It is a space where you have one-way glass where parents can observe their mm -hmm. kids within okay. the classroom learning environment. Well, we often know, and I don't want to jump in, yeah, no, absolutely. I, I just wanted to add that we often know when parents want to observe their child in the classroom setting and they enter the classroom itself, the, children are naturally drawn to their parents and so that observation might not be as authentic as we want it to be and so for those pre-arranged parent observations yes. that this observation nook is just going to be beneficial to everyone to our families to our teachers to our administration and we know that um, it serves another purpose too and that is the uh, quiet area for for students yes. if you wanted to talk a little bit about yes that. yes so of course you know the activity zone is hope is going to be an engaging active mm -hmm. learning environment but you know kids always don't want that activity mm -hmm. and sometimes stimulation. stimulation thank mm -hmm. you, stimulation. So this little alcove will also provide that opportunity for refuge. Mm -hmm. If a child wants to separate out from the activity and pull a book or yes. be working on a small project, off in the corner, space. like a quiet corner mm -hmm. uh, within the activity zone. And additionally, the activity zone will also have student storage elements like student cubbies and plenty of tackable surface for student uh, display so they can take pride in the work yes. they have been working on. Additionally, um, as you can see in some of these 3D renditions in front of you, um, you know, they kind of just reinforce the ability for classrooms to open into the activity zone, the storage elements, the tackable surfaces, the flexible mm -hmm. furnishings, and just opportunities of play um, throughout the um, activity zones. Then, um, 
moving on to the classrooms, let's take a quick look at some of the special elements that we have designed into uh, this space, starting with a reading nook that you can see in this rendition along the exterior wall. You know, an area where a child can take a book and cuddle up to possibly two to three kids mm -hmm. could snuggle up in that little alcove mm -hmm. and it's connected with nature, you know? So why create these reading nooks that are dark and on the interior, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. having it on the exterior and keeping that connection back to the right. outdoors is very important. Also, what you see in this image is the connection of classrooms with the adjacent classroom. Opportunity to, for teachers to collaborate in small areas as well as open up the activity zones and collaborate on a larger mm -hmm. scale as needed, just giving yes. them a variety of opportunities mm -hmm. uh, within the space. Looking at this interior rendition again of the classrooms, you can see opportunities of flexible furnishings, um, you know, areas where the, uh, you know, the beds or the, 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 cots. the cots, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, the cots where the kids would be taking naps are intentionally stored away. That typically seems to be an mm -hmm. afterthought in many of these classrooms right. that we have visited uh, through, through our tenure of envisioning yeah. this facility. So we wanted to make sure that was uh, intentionally designed. Um, flexible furnishings throughout so the classroom can be modified and mm -hmm. reworked as needed. So with that, um, uh, real quickly want to point out the gross motors um, area within the class, uh, within this facility, mm -hmm. which will be a common space where all students from the 16 classrooms can come together. It's a multi-purpose space. Mm -hmm. It could be a gathering space. It could mm -hmm. be a space where there are events happening sure. within this facility. It's also connected to a kitchen. Mm -hmm. And um, I do want to point out, it is right adjacent to the physical therapy yes. space so it can be used as an extension of the physical therapy component should right. the need um, should the need arise. Right. Uh, just we talked a lot about outdoor learning, mm -hmm. but I do want to also point out right outside the gross motor area is an outdoor classroom space yes. that works as an extension of this area. Right. Uh, coming to the main office space, which is our meadows, the space mm -hmm. was intentionally designed to help support the administrative function, which of course every facility right. needs, right, Kathy? Right. And I know um, you had some real vision of what the mm -hmm. space could be. If you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, so we wanted the new Early Childhood Center not just to be a place for early learning, but to be a place that supports all learners. So that includes our families, that includes our teachers, our administrative staff. So we've intentionally designed some adult learning spaces inside with a one-way glass looking into an observation room where teachers can observe other teachers teaching lessons or assessing students where we could even have family education time as well. And so that was just that was just really intentional. We want this facility to be the heartbeat of our K-12 program, uh, pre-K through 12 program, and just continuing to partner with our families and focusing on the well-being really of our family unit. Absolutely, too, so. and as you can see in this image that is in front of you, you know, Kathy talked about the parent uh, teaching and learning component, there's a flex space that is designed right outside this administration mm -hmm. area that can also be used for this purpose. Right, right. Um, so um, the office space itself, uh, there are a few images uh, that I would like to share with you that kind of just gives you a sense of how the transparency mm -hmm. helps connect back with the safety and security component. The secretaries always has, have an eye out on incoming uh, visitors within the space. And of course, we talked about the flex area already, but that kind of mm -hmm. just gives you an opportunity to see tiered seating elements that can be designed in, and it could be kind of your learning mm -hmm. commons um, yeah. uh, for the students. Then moving on to the exterior rendition of the building, um, the whole exterior was again intentionally designed uh, as we have been talking about both in terms of color 
uh, and materiality and layout. As you can see right here, the angled entry point that we uh, showed to you in the site plan creates that direct connection and access and presence of the entry on site. The canopy, as you will see um, in the next slide, shows the connection of nature with those whimsical twig-like mm -hmm. elements along the canopy and the colors that we are using throughout the interior yes. will kind of transcend out into mm -hmm. the exterior um, envelope. In addition, in addition to these elements, um, what we also wanted to do was intentionally design the two student entries mm -hmm. uh, that you see right here on the slide to again connect back to the sensory lobbies which then connect you to the activity zone which connect you to the classrooms which connect you back again to the green space so it mm -hmm. was kind of like a mm -hmm. cycle of spaces i guess uh, connections yeah. that we were trying to holistically create to support the whole child the whole child so i i I definitely agree, Nandita, and, and I think that one of the things that as we kind of bring this to a close that you and I have really had a passion for these last several years and continue to work as we realize this, pro, uh, this project to its, uh, to its conclusion though, is that that well-designed physical environment is so critical um, to compo a critical component as we realize the full benefits of early childhood programming, um, whether you know it's how you place windows and fixtures, whether it's the uh, sensory furnishings or the, the, the finishes that you use, the lighting that you bring in, all of those things just encourage that cognitive development yes. that we started out talking about today and, and how the research supports that. So I want to thank you for partnering oh. with, uh, with me as we as we as we work on this project together. Thank you, Kathy. This has been a pleasure. You know, this is my passion, so yes. so I am excited. Um, well, thank you again for joining us today. Yep. And, um, and if, given, any, if yeah. anyone's interested in talking Absolutely. with Nandita or myself, please feel free to reach out. I know that when the facility is complete, we'll be happy to look at scheduling tours as well. But if there are questions along the way as you undertake your own projects and envisioning, please feel free to reach out to either one of us and we'll be happy to speak with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thanks, everyone.